Well, Henry, for, first of all, just can you give me an idea of why you decided to look into this area mm -hmm. that is the, the book mm -hmm. is the result of? Well, I'd never written anything on on the border. Um, um, my specialisms had been on the Northern Irish state, on Protestant working class, on unionism. I'd done a, I'd done a book on, written a book on republicanism at the end of the 1980s. And the way I came on this was that um, um, I was looking back over the, what had been written about the republican movement and the IRA during the Troubles, and it struck me that it was a big gap that it all focused on, not all, but mostly on urban areas. And, Belfast and Derry in particular, and very little had been done on the campaign in outside. And I started to look at um, newspapers from border areas, and particularly from Fermanagh and South Tyrone, from the beginning of the Troubles from 1969 through. And I just um, and that opened up the whole question, um, not just of the IRA campaign, but of what its effects were, what. Uh, community relations were like before the Troubles, what effect did the violence have? And there was, it was just a wealth of material um, in the pa uh, papers like The Impartial Reporter, The Fermanagh, Fermanagh Herald. There's a, whole, there's, a, there's a whole world there that uh, I, having lived through the Troubles here, uh, was only sort of very partially aware of. So that's how I got into it, really. Um, try and I mean, develop an area which I'd already written about but hadn't had any focus on the border areas. And what about your own background mm. and upbringing or family? Did you have any connection no, with no, the No, no, mine was distinctly my... Uh, I was brought up in, um, in Bangor, um, in North Down, in the, in the 50s and 60s. And my, my father had been involved in the... the trade union movement, the labour movement, so that was my background. I had no relatives in border areas. I, I had no connection in border areas. I'd only passed through border areas on my way to, say, Donegal or, or to Dublin, I'd, but I'd, I'd never, no, exp um, no connection. And then take me on from starting off looking at local newspapers, getting a flavour and a taste. Where then did your research take you and what does someone like you where do you go to? What sources do you delve mm -hmm. into? What, you know, Irish documents, British documents? Mm -hmm. um, well, um, I'd say that the richest resource uh, were, were the local newspapers of the time. Um, and then interviews with people who um, from border areas. Um, but there is a lot of material. Uh, I, I went into the British archives in, in Kew. National Archives in Kew, and the Irish uh, government's archives in Bishop Street in Dublin. And I found, um, certainly in the British archives, it was a very rich source, but looking at it from very much from the strategic point of view, because the British and uh, I suppose the Irish as well were concerned about the, uh, the importance that the border had in, um, in sustaining support in the IRA campaign. So the British focus what you get there is the uh, um, the challenge that the very existence of the border represented to uh, British attempts to deal with the IRA campaign. So it's a mixture of sources, um, newspapers, interviews and in governmental archives. Now when I heard you launch the book and introduce mm -hmm. the book in Fermanagh, um, there were quite a few hard-hitting points you made mm -hmm. about the fact that the IRA campaign could not have been sustained without the border mm. and the impact that the border had and how the IRA were able to exploit mm. the border. So mm. if you can tell mm. me something about that. Well, it's pretty clear from very early on that um, now the border areas themselves uh, were predominantly Catholic areas and these were areas where um, there, had been, there was discrimination under the, um, in Northern Ireland. Um, under unionism in the in the Stormont period, so there was a great deal of um, you know political resentment in these areas, and these areas had been uh, areas where there was a strong uh, Republican subculture uh, throughout the his history of the state. However, at the, at the time um, there was also very strong constitutional nationalist, a stronger tradition of them. Um, 
So there are areas which were, in a sense, traditionally disaffected areas, but they're also, uh, from a nationalist or Republican point of view, but there was a, they were also areas where, um, um, where you, you did have also a substantial minority population of Protestants. And um, despite the fact that people had very opposed political views, they had been able, in a way, to work out um, a modus vivendi. You know, there were limits on that. You didn't sell land to, to Catholics. There, there wasn't any, or any intermarriage, stuff like that. But at a level of basic uh, civility and respecting, in a sense, the reality of the other's existence and their culture, there was, in a way, a more, um, uh, in, a, in a way, it was a more harmonious society in, in, in intercommunal terms than you got in some urban, in, in urban areas. Um, and so in a way, the violence that, that, uh, that, that started in these areas or, or spread in these areas in a way from what was going on in, in broader terms, um, I think was um, in a way, both communities that had happened in the past, so it wasn't novel in that sense, um, but its effects were um, much more devastating. Um, um, due to the length of time it went on and the pretty widespread nature of it um, than anything that, that had ha happened before. And I suppose what I argue in the, argue in the book was that um, because of the relative ease with which people could cross the border in both directions um, for social purposes, for smuggling, it, it, it was a sort of godsend strategic godsend for the NRA because they could um, plan operations uh, in the Republic, carry them out in the, in the north, uh, carry them out on the border and, as it were, retreat into the realm of security of the, of, the, of the Republic where you're dealing with a, um, a totally different security situation or state and security force situation than you were in the north. You had a routinely unarmed police force, the Garda Shikona, which was in the, it, it was in the priority. It, it, it was the lead force in dealing with questions like border security. So it was, um, leave out the question of collusion, where I say in the book that collusion obviously exists and we know from the Semitic Tribunal that clear cases of collusion. But I don't think fundamentally that was the problem. I think the, prob the problem was a much more profound, profound problem, different, different priorities uh, between what the British state wanted and what the Irish state wanted. Um, and uh, I, that created a framework with the, with the provisionals, the IRA could operate uh, relatively, un, not totally unhindered, but relatively unhindered. Yes, I think that night in Fermanagh, you, you referred to something about the prevailing um, kind of political culture mm. in the South being sort of acceptable, accepting of? Well, I mean, I think it's the, there's um, political culture in the South, the dominant one um, throughout the Troubles was that this, the source of the violence lay fairly and squarely within Northern Ireland in terms of the history of the Northern Ireland state, the alienation of the Catholic population its lack of a positive relationship with the forces of law and order. And that, until that was addressed, uh, the IRA campaign was, uh, you, you couldn't, the effective way of dealing with the IRA campaign was not security, but political change in the North. Right? And um, it seems uh, that meant that every time the British asked them to do anything in relationship at the security level to deal with the IRA, um, the way they saw it was here's the British trying to avoid what the real issue is and to blame us uh, uh, on the security front for what is essentially their problem or their problem or the unionist problem, not our problem. I mean, it wasn't all, I mean, no governments changed. Not every government had that position. Um, and particularly the 73, 77 coalition, as I point out, um, Labour Fine Gael coalition took a took a distinctly uh, harder line against the the IRA than uh, the Fianna Fáil administration pre it or post it. I think the the border was uh, clearly uh, the provisional IRA campaign had lots of different causes and routes 
and sources of strength, but the ability to use the border and the territory of the Republic was core um, um, for, the, for the long war. Because basically, from the late 1970s, uh, the leadership of the IRA realised all they had, what they had to do was keep it going. I mean, I mean, they weren't going to defeat the British, but they had to basically make sure that the British were unable to close down by the sort of the armed struggle. And without the border, they couldn't have done that. And there were a couple of things you, you referred to again that night in Fermanagh about, and. It kind of surprised me, as someone who worked as a journalist throughout the years of the Troubles, um, you talked about the number of uh, improvised explosive devices mm. that came from the South mm. during a particular era and that the IRA's kind of engineering operation or, or mm. capabilities were all Southern based. Yeah, I mean, largely, largely. Because, again, it's just easier to, to um, produce IEDs. Um, to, to uh, produce rocket launchers, mortars, things like that, um, in, a, in the relatively relaxed security environment that you would have uh, in the Republic. And it could be as far south as down in Munster and Kerry, things like that. So you, you had a relatively sophisticated um, um, logistics operation, which again was a core fundraising as well. All these things, training, fundraising, weapons production, you, they needed the territory. And it was very, very effectively, very well done. Very, by the end of the 80s, very professional operation. I suppose it's uh, difficult to surprise a historian or someone who has studied uh, the political life as much as you have. But in the documents, were you surprised or did you raise an odd eyebrow at anything that you came across? Um, well, it, the, the, I suppose part of the problem with the official documents is that they're on the Irish side, they're very sparse because the, uh, there's virtually nothing from the Department of Justice, which was the department which would have dealt with, with issues like the, uh, the, Gar, the Garda, Shikona, the special branch, and obviously um, where all the key material on IRA activities would be, and that's just not available. Now, um, there's, a lot of, there's quite a lot of material held back in the British files as well. But in the British files, you generally are told such and such a file in the provisional IRA has been retained right, um, for 50 years or indefinitely or whatever. You don't actually know in Bishop Street. There's no, there are no pointers in the files, but you just know that there are very, very little from the Department of Justice. So as one of the surprising things I found about it was given how important it was, how little material there was available for historians. And I think it's one of the things which people talk about all the time. Well, we've got to deal with the past. It's we've got to address the past. Well, you can't address the past without this material. Um, and I think you've got to just put a big, big question mark uh, over whether um, f in the short to medium term, the past will be adequately addressed because uh, um, certainly uh, there's no sign that the Irish state's going to make material available. I think there's a lot of material in the British files uh, which any British government would be reluctant. I think for quite understandable reasons uh, to, make, uh, to make, av make available, except under very, uh, like the De Silva inquiry, where um, you give them to a respected legal figure but the papers themselves are not made of, uh, quite a lot of material would be held back or redacted. I was surprised that in conducting over more than 90 interviews mm. for Border Lives, only twice, I think, did anyone use the term ethnic mm. cleansing. Mm. One from a Protestant, one from a Republican in Clonus, mm. um, who was basically denying the existence of a policy mm. of ethnic cleansing when actually I didn't mention it or no one else had mentioned it. Uh, in terms of your research, what are you left feeling about that terminology? Well, first of all, where, where did it come from? Where did this term? And it, it was introduced into the language of discourse of politics here and talking about the campaign uh, in the early 1990s uh, because, uh, as a sort of uh, blowback from Yugoslavia. Uh, 
which was the, uh, the term was used almost clearly. And it was brought up by unionist politicians. And one of the politicians who made most of it uh, was Ian Paisley, uh, um, uh, who was a long-standing st critic of the British government uh, security policy in, in, in border areas. Used to, before ethnic cleansing was used, it was used to be called genocide. Um, now, I've done um, in, a couple, uh, in an article I did for an academic journal on terrorism, I looked specifically at the use of the term, at its origins and that. And clearly, if you compare what was going on in, in Northern Ireland or in the borders of Northern Ireland Republic in the 70s and 80s, with what went on in Yugoslavia, where you have actual state-sponsored um, eliminations of populations or uh, uh, murders, uh, intimidation, to remove a population of a, you know, the other ethnic group from particular areas. That, 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 then clearly that is, that did not happen in Northern Ireland. You do not, I mean, because basically the group responsible uh, for the violence, which some certainly, and I did, did have, I've heard the term used quite a lot more than you did, but I mean, I think it depends who you talk to. Certainly some of the unionist victims groups have used it, <coughs> used it quite a lot. It, the term is, um, academically um, not appropriate, and I said that in the, in the article. What you have is a campaign uh, which is, uh, has deeply sectarian effects, um, um, whatever the intention of the, of the people who carried out its effects on polarising people and deepening divisions and causing hatred and suspicion, particularly amongst Protestants of Catholic neighbours. Uh, um, I think it was um, profoundly divisive and sectarian policy. Um, I don't think myself that it's a, it's a helpful term. Um, on the other hand, if some victim wants to use it, uh, I'm not going to be a po-faced academic and say, oh, well, did you realise that what you had to undergo was nothing like that, that people in, 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 in Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, had to suffer, because that's an insult. Right? So I don't get hung up on the term, but certainly uh, it was brought in, in a sense, um, uh, initially in, to describe the experience by uh, um, by, by the DUP, which was exploiting, uh, as it did consistently throughout the Troubles, the anguish and the hurt that border Protestants to get a support base, to undermine support for the UUP. Uh, and certainly some of the most disillusioned people I've talked to uh, in border areas or people who left the UUP to, to, to support the DUP uh, and then had to, had to live with uh, what happened in two, two, 2007. So, I mean, basically, I don't think we need the term ethnic cleansing to, to um, as it were, um, establish that something bad went on, something very bad went on. Um, and I don't think you need to call it ethnic cleansing. You need to call it by what it was. It was, an, uh, it was a ruthless campaign waged quite consciously to keep the pot boiling uh, until uh, the British would do a deal. And in that sense, as I say at the end of the book, it was uh, whatever people say about the defeat of the IRA, that campaign wasn't defeated. That campaign was successful. One of the Republicans that I spoke to, I was saying mm. that I was hoping mm. to get a context from mm. you, having just done mm. this book, uh, Ireland's Violent Frontier, and he said, oh, well, he's the unionist yeah. Uh, yeah. historian. Yeah. Well, I mean, people put you in boxes, and um, I don't regard myself as a unionist historian. I mean, the first book, or the second book I wrote with, with Paul Beer and Peter Gibbon, well, it was the first serious, you know, archive-based criticism of the unionist state and its uh, discriminatory and sectarian nature. Um, I don't think unionist historian would have written that. Um, I've written about the, the Republican movement. Um, my own individual, everybody's got their individual political point of view, but as an historian I go where the evidence evidence takes me. It's just a way of essentially uh, 
what does it say? Play in the, play in the man, not the ball. You know, it's, it's a way of. I mean, Republicans have. Everything I've written has been more or less denounced and unfollowed by, as a unionist, uh, as a unionist uh, propaganda exercise. But there you go. That's Northern Ireland. I mean, I regard this book as a really important book. You've covered ground that nobody mm. or few have, mm. have touched on before. Mm. I think it's very significant. You talked earlier about dealing with the past. Mm. And I would have imagined that your book would have been mm. well received and generated a lot of interest mm. to help us deal with the past. But you haven't found that. No, no, not in the slightest. I mean, it's, it's the book I've written or co-written has been least reviewed. Uh, I found it quite remarkable that, for instance, the BBC Northern Ireland has, has done nothing about it. Sunday Sequence, William Crawley's programme, every, there's lots of stuff about dealing with the past. No request for it, nothing about the book on that. Um, uh, Belfast Telegraph, nothing. Um, Irish News, nothing. Irish Times, nothing. So my feeling is that it deals with things that people essentially find embarrassing. Um, it's, in terms of the history of republicanism, uh, it's such a one-sided conflict. I mean, it's, it's not, uh, in terms of who's the victimizers and who's the victim. And if you've got a very strong victim narrative, uh, as republicanism does, this doesn't fit into it because very much you're in, you're, uh, you're the people who are doing the victimising pretty clearly in somewhere like Fermanagh and South Tyrone. So I think it's, it's deeply embarrassing. So, I mean, that's my explanation um, for why it's been uh, largely ignored. Although I, I, I hear from the publisher that it's, it's sold quite well, um, despite, as I say, the, uh, the, the, the very high price that poor people have to pay to buy the book. And, and just going back to what you said earlier about um, the lack of Irish mm. government documents mm. and access maybe mm. to, to more British government documents to help us adequately look back mm. at the past, uh, it would make one feel somewhat depressed about our ability to be able to do that. Yeah, well, I think there are, I mean, there are ideas, and I'm associated with a group called Archiv, which is trying to make the case for... Um, some sort of comprehensive dealing with the past uh, based on, on the official archives would be a, a core thing. It's not the only way, obviously, the sort of thing you're doing, the sort of interviews you've done are, are part of the whole process. So, but I think without the documents really into, we talk about things like collusion or ethnic cleansing, um, uh, people make accusations about um, both states and what they did or didn't do during the Troubles. And the only way that you can really come to any comprehensive, balanced view of all these things is through looking at the documents. Um, and um, I, I recognise that for both governments, um, there'd have to be massive safeguards and a lot of safeguards as to how these documents were made available. But until that happens, then I think in a way, a lot of the discussion about dealing with the past seems to me just to go round in the same old repetitive circles of blame and uh, counter accusation, and, um, which gets us nowhere, essentially. I feel that there's a lot more work that needs to be done of the sort of academic work that I, I did for this book. Um, um, there's a lot more of these local newspapers which are on both sides of the border which uh, historians can be looking at. I've, I, I've got a, a part-time postgraduate at, at University of Ulster working on the guards' response to the, the challenges of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, how they percolated into border counties. And so that would be just one example. So um, I was sort of dipping my toe in it, in, in a way. And so I'm aware, I mean, you know, we said very kind things about the book, but the more I look at it, the, the more I'm aware of the inadequacies in it and how much more you could do and issues that I raise which aren't resolved.
or issues which are raised could be challenged. Um, so I think it's uh, it's all of a work in work in progress. But I mean, I think it started now, and you know the sort of work you're doing and other academic work I know it would be would be going on. So I think within you know the next decade we're going to know a lot more about this than we do you know we did even a couple of years ago or even now.